you have to understand like to do things right, to do things correct. Um, you know, it takes, it takes years to learn. It takes years of experience. Um, and I, I told all the kids, you know, I'm like, Hey, this sounds like a great opportunity. I said, but realize if you win, you know, you're winning a million dollar prize, but you now they have a million dollars worth of expectations. It, 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 this is a business and everything is an investment of time, money, and effort in a product, which is you. So now you've invested a million dollars in Daniel Pewter. You want that a million bucks back, don't you? I'm sure they were, the, the, the offenders were motivated to make their point perfectly clear, but, uh, couldn't do that today. Couldn't do it today at all. Daniel Pewter is one of the most divisive people in pro wrestling history. You will either see him as a person who earned his hate or someone who was a victim of WWE's culture at the time. Pewter was an accomplished athlete in many respects before joining WWE. The WWE had launched its latest season of Tough Enough, and as a boxer and unbeaten MMA fighter, Pewter was a heavy favorite at the time, with the exploding popularity of UFC just beginning to pick up momentum. Pewter had the look of a fighter of the time, and the fans responded very well to him. Throughout the competition, he and former American gladiator Justice Smith were the two consistently cheered. This season was not much different than any other season, as these were just an excuse for WWE to get in on the reality show competition trend of the time, and they consisted of goofy competitions and elimination ceremonies. Most people knew this was the formula and didn't bother to watch, and WWE were very aware of that. They would go out of their way to put the contestants on the actual WWE shows. In the middle of Raw or SmackDown, the young hopefuls would be paraded out to near universal boos. And everyone openly hates these segments, even on the commentary. But one night in 2004, that would all change. But before we discuss what happened that night, we need to discuss how we got there and who is to blame for the idea. After the brawl for all and how that played out, you would think this company would have learned its lesson and no one would ever suggest such a foolish notion as to put another shoot fight in the ring hoping for a predetermined outcome. But clearly someone did. Who was the genius behind this? Paul Heyman wanted to have, and we've talked about this on, on the Heyman show, but Paul wanted to have Nunzio, okay, who's legit um, shoot wrestler a uh, very tough kid but he's he's smaller he trained with billy robinson and he is a really tough guy but he wanted nunzio to stretch all the guys and that's how it started out in an attempt to mitigate the risks of paul Heyman's incredibly stupid plan they somehow made it a thousand times worse they would choose kurt angle to take on the task of engaging in an actual grappling match with a random contestant. Now they would not be risking the reputation of a lower card wrestler. They would now be putting the reputation of a main eventer on the line for what might be one of Paul Heyman's most ridiculous escapades while having the pin for SmackDown. Further measures were taken by Bruce Pritchard and others to try to find a favorable outcome by the end of this. But as has been stated before, you can never try to put on something as a shoot and hope for a predetermined outcome. So as we're doing this, we're sitting there and I said, well, what you have to do is uh, I went old school. This is where I did get involved because I went back to the Gene Anderson and style of training guys. And so one thing that Gene used to do was he would make guys run the steps for hours. And he would hit them with uh, 
broom handles and shit like that. And then once they ran the steps, he would make them do a thousand squats and go, go run the steps some more and then hit the ropes back and forth. And then, uh, all this other shit before they ever locked up before they ever did anything. And then once they were blown so sky high that their legs were spaghetti, then the guy would beat the shit out of them. Okay. So, okay, now let's wrestle. And the wrestler, of course, being, he would be fresh ready to go and he would stretch the guy the people that came back from that were the ones that really wanted to be in the business the ones that couldn't handle that that's how they would weed them out not saying that's a good way to do it or not as a matter of fact i don't think it's a good way to do it in today's day and age but for this competition my idea was i said well we need to run them we got to blow them up first so we took them back and there was a ramp uh, backstage and we made them run sprints up and down the ramp and we made them do these squat thrusts and all this other shit but we, we had them sprint uh, forever until they were dragging then once they ran the sprints we took them in and fed them fettuccine alfredo so the contest in there was uh, you gotta eat so many bowls of this heavy creamy fettuccine alfredo so now you're stuffing your face with fettuccine Alfredo, and the only thing that they had to drink, they had like two, uh, not gallons, but the next smaller size of milk that you had to wash it down with. So you had to eat what was in front of you. You had to eat the fettuccine Alfredo, and you had to wash it down with the milk. Now, And one of them may have been buttermilk as well. So now you've been running like crazy. You've eaten all this pasta, drank all this milk, now let's go run again. You run them some more. We've made them do squats. Now it's time for them to go out and do the competition thing. So now they got to do the, the squat thrusts and all that other crap. And the idea was to blow them up. Well, watching all this shit, I noticed Daniel Pewter, he wasn't sprinting. He was just kind of jogging and he, he wasn't going hard at all. Uh, plus, he didn't eat. He wasn't eating his pasta. And I told Johnny, I said, hey, I said, this motherfucker over here, you know, he's not eating and he's not sprinting. Uh, he's conserving his energy. So, you know, they got on him and all this shit. And I don't know that he ate all of everything he was supposed to eat because we had a time constraint, too, that we had to get through and we had to get these guys done. So they get up there and the one kid one kid won and Kurt stretched him. So that, that all happened before they ever even got to the air, but it wasn't done in a way old school. It was guys, guys were cheating and they were letting them slide. So they're, they're going through the tough enough tournament thing. And, and one of the things they had the guys do that day was eating plates of pasta all day long and doing wind sprints up the ramp and all this stuff, getting getting these guys all blown up. And then the final came to TV. On TV, they had them do burpees or the squat thrusts. And, and they keep going until there was one man left. You know, of course they start and of course, Kurt makes quick work of this poor kid, just ties him up in knots and stuff like that. And you know, we raise Kurt's hand the whole bit. Charles and I are in the ring. And then Kurt just looks over at the rest of the, the, the guys on the floor and says, anybody else want to give it a shot? And I looked at Al Snow, who is, you know, the tough enough trainer. And he looked at me and went, Kurt's going to do what Kurt's going to do. So Pewter puts his hand up and Kurt goes, okay, you get in here. And I'm, like, and I'm looking at Al going, what do you do? He's not going to stop Kurt. Kurt's going to do what he's going to do. So, okay, here we go, guys. Amateur match. So that day was crazy. Uh, sprints, um, eating food, eating pasta, drinking milk, more for liners, um, you know, and then and then out to the ring and up-down competition. The, the difference was in me and how I trained is I trained smart. Everybody else just trained hard. I trained smart and hard. And everybody else trained hard. I trained for the longevity so i was not only doing two three four hours of promos a day i was doing my the right cardio the right eating even though we were living in a hotel um uh, I, I wasn't partying drinking you know going out late i was getting my sleep uh, i was stretching right so i was really doing everything properly 
Um, definitely because I learned a lot of that from Frank Shamrock and Javier Mendez of how to train properly as an athlete. Um, but I trained for an endurance athlete too, like MMA is 15, 20, 25 minutes, you know, we're, we're training. So um, going into the ring with Kurt that day, I, one of my coaches, Danny Shade, uh, was a runner up to him in the Olympics. I think he lost by a couple points. Um, and um, so I knew that Kurt couldn't be that much better than him uh, because those guys are all at the top, you know, you win by a couple points on, on a day. It's either, you know, all the guys are that good. It just depends on if you get the move and if you can pull it off. So Danny used to whoop me, but I knew that if I, you know, if I was out there doing MMA, I would do really well because he's not an MMA. There's a whole, it's a different sport. You know I mean? It's, it's like, it's like motorcycle riding versus car, car. It's like motorcycle dr uh, racing versus car driving. It might be the same concept of an engine and tires and everything else but it's a whole different framework uh let's go so they get into it and they're, they're really going at it and then they get tied up in the corner and somehow pewter got what i later found out was a key lock or a kimura like a legit shoot oh, yeah. submission like if you don't tap he's going to take your arm basically kind of hold on kurt and I didn't realize it was that bad at the time, but I knew it wasn't good. So in my mind, all I could think of is, how do we get out of this darn thing? So when they fell to the ground, Kurt fell on top of him, still in that, that hammer lock, in that key lock. And I just, it, I, it wasn't like, okay, I'm waiting for this opportunity. Once they hit the ground, I saw they were down, and I just counted. I counted three. And, I, and that was it, end of the match. And then Kurt got up and, and, uh, got in his face, gave him a whole bunch of heck and stuff like that. And to Pewter's credit, he was like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I looked at Al, he looked at me, he went, he nodded. And then I didn't know what was going to happen. So I went back to Gorilla. Um, so I went in there and, and, you know, I saw his arm and I said, you know, I'll pull this little sucker, see how far I can pull it off. And, um, you know, I wasn't even on my back. You know, you can, you can look at the referee, what they said. Um, you know, they, they said in the back, uh, you know, they told the refs to, to three count it. And, you know, they, they, it's crazy how they can cheat in a real event in a, in a scripted entertainment industry. Well, you know, it was a wrestling match and, you know, he caught me in a submission and it really wasn't supposed to be submission. I told him that afterward. I said, you're a dumbass because you pinned yourself. Multiple veterans of the WWE from both in ring and behind the curtain have expressed how much of a disaster this event was. Well, here's the whole idea behind it, though. You had an amateur wrestler, and it was amateur rules, and that was what Kurt was out there doing. But you had dumb fuck referees that didn't know what an amateur pin was. If both shoulders touch the mat, you're out. That's the pin. It's that quick. Um, so the fact that he bridged out on three... Who the fuck cares? He was pinned. He was down. So he was pinned. And the referee didn't know any better. And the, I don't think, but at the same time, and I'll defend the referees here, I don't think anybody thought it would get to that point ever. Um, so it just was, it was ill-conceived. It was uh, ill-executed. And Kurt put himself in that position. And the kid, I mean, the kid had his arm locked in. If the kid wanted to break his arm, he could have broken his arm. Yeah, and that's why we don't do things like that. We try to, as much as possible, work everything so that we don't allow for outcomes that we can't control in a public setting. And there were other people who insisted, even though I advised, not to have that situation. And I was like, I would suggest you don't do that because they're, these are all young healthy, strong guys. And I would not put Kurt at risk of doing that. Well, what do I know? And then... As you would expect, the mood backstage was that of disappointment and rage, mostly led up by men in suits who had no one to blame but themselves for what had just taken place in the ring. As I was walking through Gorilla, I could see, I see Mr. Briscoe there, and he just looks at me and he goes, that's all he did. Little thumbs up as I walked by, and that was it. And then I get to the back, and I, and I run into Fit, and Fit goes, what happened there? I said, 
I don't know. He just went into business for himself and just did that. He said, who told you to count? I said, nobody. I just, I just did it. It, it without thinking. I just did it. He said, well, you probably saved uh, Angle's arm. And I went, is it that bad? Like, again, not being an MMA guy, I didn't know the severity of the hold. I found that out afterwards. Well, Kurt was pissed off, and I was pissed off at Kurt. Um, I was pissed off at Paul Heyman. I was pissed off at Paul Heyman for getting in Kurt's ear and pumping him up so much that that's what Kurt felt that he needed to do. And it just made every it, it made the the business look bad. It made Kurt look bad, and there was there was no need for it. Uh, it was my anger, I guess, is the best way to put it. So. I was pissed off at Kurt for letting it go that far. I was pissed off at Heyman for getting him riled up. I was pissed off at Pewter for uh, fucking getting in there. Uh, I had a lot of pissed off to go around. In what had to come as a shock to a lot of wrestling fans, Daniel Pewter would manage to win the entire Tough Enough competition, defeating future WWE champion The Miz in the finals. A lot of people would assume that this meant that he had somehow overcame the heat that had been put on him after the Kurt Angle incident. Unfortunately, this was far from the case. After winning the $1 million Tough Enough, Daniel Pewter would be booked in his first and last WWE match as a participant in the Royal Rumble. He you know, there were rumors of his attitude and, uh, you know, he was pissing off some of the boys. Uh, you know, he told somebody he was in the main event at Royal Rumble. And, uh, you know, they were like, what are you talking about? You're in the main event. He said, well, I'm in the Rumble. And they said, that's not the main event. <laughs> and uh, so he just came across as arrogant. And I think a lot of the guys took their frustrations out on him at the Rumble. Um, I had no clue what they were going to do. Um, they treated me like crap and, uh, very disrespectful. Um, I didn't know that was coming like that. Um, you know, again, it, you know, companies not taking care of people, you know, I mean, it's, it's simple. Like, you know, it, it, what's crazy is this is, is certain athletes will do whatever it takes to get on TV and do what their puppet master says. Sure. Doesn't matter how harmful it is. It doesn't matter if they're against it morally or whatever. They're they will do what they're told. Hey, almost like an indoctrination, a rite of passage. We we're expected to do us veterans are expected to do things like this to find out how tough this shooter really is. And uh, so, if if Daniel Pewter thought that they took advantage of him. I'd say he was right. Well, the physicality, you know, you're getting a chopped on the pecs. It's not like you're, you're going to go to the hospital over it. Uh, it's painful, stings, hurts. Is it debilitating? Not really. Uh, but, it, but it's very impressive in the ring, especially when you get noise and the crowd reaction. So uh, I don't remember anybody getting any. I mean, it probably was addressed, but more than likely in that era, it was addressed in a way that you're kind of laughing about it. You know, you guys really gave that kid an eye-opening experience as far as, as far as it went. What are you going to say? What are you going to do? Don't do that again. You're an adult. You're a professional. I'd like for you not to do that again. It just it goes against uh, time and memorial of how talents were broken in especially with talents that had a real tough guy reputation, how tough are they? And so those three guys, Benoit and Eddie and Bob, decided to find out just how tough this kid was. So I'm sure there's a lot of inside jokes. What are you guys going to do? You know, I'm sure they were, the, the, the offenders were motivated to make their point perfectly clear. But uh, couldn't do that today. Couldn't do it today at all. Uh, if you watch the match, uh, and during the Royal Rumble, uh, they were chopping the crap out of them, the chest chopping, just brutalizing them. So I could have taken all three of them 
if it, if I if I wanted to go smash them all. Um, Hardcore Holly is he tough? Yeah, but he's he's uh, he he helped coach me back in the day. I asked him for help and support, and then he went to talk smack in his book to get better ratings and sell more books. So he's a profiteer. He doesn't care about people at this point, from my perspective, and um, he's insignificant and rude. I don't think about him. Uh, Eddie Guerrero and Chris Benoit. Um, I thought they were nice guys. Um, I liked Eddie, but uh, you know, after that happened, I thought that, I thought both of them. You know, it is what it is. Like again, you know, look at look at who treats people good in this world, and look at who treats people like crap, and see what happens to their lives. And they create their own their their own outcomes. Not long after the Rumble, the WWE would approach Daniel Pewter with a contract for much less money than the million dollar Tough Enough four years for two hundred and fifty thousand a year had promised him. Pewter would decline the contract. It, you yeah, have to understand it was a million dollar contract over four years, which is still. $250,000 a year. But here's the problem. A million dollars worth of expectations from you. Now you're starting with literally zero knowledge and zero experience, okay? And you're supposed to be able to produce at a million dollar level. What do you think that's, what do you think your chances of success are? Unfortunately, in this business, every once in a while, as I, I have said before, you know, eventually that damn bell has to ring and that red light has to go on. Right. I don't know that, you know, even years later, I, I don't know that uh, Pewter's is got the charisma to make it to the next level, in, in at least in this business. I maybe he does in other businesses and maybe elsewhere, but I don't think that he ever had that that, oh my God, I've got to see Daniel Pewter. Um, I just don't think he had it. After leaving the WWE, Daniel would continue his training and for a time would even entertain a run in TNA, but only to face one person. He's an aggressive businessman. He is, it's like, he'd make a, a hell of a salesman. He knocks on doors and, um, I don't say it doesn't take no for an answer, but he's he's aggressive and he's he's um, very conversational and he's persistent and has some perseverance. We had multiple phone calls. Uh, we had one that I could remember saying, "Dude, I gotta go," and then here we'd go another ten minutes. Uh, and, and, and yep, uh, I mean, gotta go. <laughs> you know, one of those uh, conversations that you have. But I like him uh, a lot, and and he was persistent, and he wanted to do something. Uh, in TNA with Kurt. Never, and to this day, I don't know what kind of commitment, commitment Daniel wanted to make to his in-ring game. I, and I, I, I don't. And so, um, to me, that's the longevity of any talent. You know, when, when you well, we use Kurt. Kurt, um, obviously, world champion, uh, and I say that in amateur, gold medalist, but he went to Memphis. Let's make no two bones about it. Um, he committed. Uh, he committed to camps. He got into this industry, soaked it up like a sponge. And that's sort of where the rubber meets the road when when I have always analyzed talent. Are they willing to uh, go to the UK and work 30 days straight uh, on, on those, those, those kind of tours? Are they willing to go to Japan for three weeks? Hey, I got a I, multiple times. Hey, I, I can probably get you in Mexico. Ooh, I don't want to go. I, I, I don't know about that. Okay. Where are you going to get your work at? Uh, so I, I never knew how many reps Daniel got. In one of his more well-known post WWE moments, Daniel Pewter would conduct an interview with the referee that had counted his shoulders down during the Kurt Angle incident. Hey guys, my name is Daniel Pewter. I won Million Dollar Tough Enough on WWE. Jimmy Cordero is former WWE referee. So Jimmy, I want you to tell everybody about what happened uh, when I got in the ring with Kurt Angle and Kurt Angle, um, let's just say almost broke his arm. Yeah, um, it was kind of a, a funny situation there where uh, you guys were having a little bit of an impromptu, I want to say amateur style. Well, 
Well, you guys told me no, no punching, no kicking, no striking, but everything else goes. Yeah, that's what that's that was my understanding. Like I said, it was impromptu. It was like Kurt kind of did it, uh, made up the rules as we went along. But anyways, uh, Daniel here happened to get what was known as a key lock or Kimura on Kurt Angle, and I saw that things were not looking too good, and obviously for Kurt, of course. Uh, let's, for his arm, and for his arm, let, for his arm and shoulder, and uh, life. I panicked, and Reputation. I thought this. The, when they went to the ground, and Daniel's back was on the ground. I figured this was my opportunity to end. Oh, but the, was my back really on the ground? Because I think only half my back, from what I saw on TV, was on the ground, and then they got rid of that other half. So it, there were some challenges there. Yeah, um, you know, I made a discretionary call and thought this would be a perfect opportunity. To end. Before I ended Kurt's career, life, and everything else? Well, uh, let me put it this way. Kurt was not going to tap. And there was a good chance that the arm would come with you. So I would have taken his arm unless you impromptu pinned me for no good reason. Because my back was not on the ground. Um, quite possibly. <laughs> quite possibly. So the truth comes out. For years, there was a push to get Daniel Pewter and Kurt Angle into the ring together be it for a pro wrestling match or if Kurt Angle is believed inside of the UFC cage as he would claim that Dana White approached him for his debut to be in a match one-on-one -on -one with Daniel Pewter. Kurt Angle would never make his UFC debut nor would Daniel Pewter and Kurt Angle ever have their match. Eventually Daniel Pewter would settle into a life of youth outreach. He set up several schools, as well as joined law enforcement. Fight crime, save lives, make the world safe for democracy. Something Pewter is eager to get to work on. There will always be some kind of debate on whether or not Daniel Pewter was always set up to fail. Whether there was always a conspiracy behind the scenes to make sure that he never made it after he made Kurt Angle look bad in the ring. But that is a debate that Daniel probably won't have much to say about. Since his time beginning motivational speaking and youth outreach, Daniel has taken a much different approach than in previous years. And that approach is probably best described in one of his many talks that he gave. So I find a lot of time people look at like, we don't technically have to breathe for instance, we, we can die. We don't have to, right? Like it's not mandatory, we can just die. But I think the only have to we have to in this world is we have to die. Like my buddy in Dubai, he doesn't have to pay taxes. In the US we have to pay, you know, we have to pay taxes, but you can move out of the US and not pay taxes. Or you go to jail, you get to go to jail. <laughs> So it's interesting on perspective. I find a lot of time people think they have to do something where if you wanted to choose something else, you could. At the end of the day, Daniel Pewter simply chose to do something different. But if that's not a good enough conclusion for you, we have an alternative, a different perspective, if you will. Do it a goddamn way. Hey, hey. Hey, we're doing a reality show inside of goddamn entertainment show with an entertainer and a shooter who's real, who goddamn we want real rules, motherfucker. <laughs>